So chapter 10 deals with refrigeration and heat pump. A lot of this is a review from Thermo 1. I believe you're exposed to the Carnot refrigeration cycle as well as the vapor compression refrigeration cycle. But new would be multi-stage refrigeration. And uh, I think the heat pump you're already familiar with, but um, gas refrigeration is new. But So today's a little bit of a review. So as the components of the Carnot refrigeration cycle, you have an evaporator, which is just a heat exchanger, a condenser, a compressor, and a turbine. And the refrigerant flows in this counterclockwise direction. They uh, put the numbering system as one as the input to the compressor, then two, then three, and four for the states. So going through the compressor, it's isentropic because it's insulated and reversible. So on a TS diagram, it's straight up. And they want state two to be saturated vapor, so it's pegged on the TS on that edge of the dome here. So it's saturated vapor. So there is a quality to state one. And then Coming out of state at uh, out of the condenser at state three, it's saturated liquid, so it's also on the edge of the dome. And you expand it through a turbine, which doesn't exist in practice. And you also have a quality at state four, and it's also insulated. It's reversible, hence isentropic, constant S. There are two heat exchangers operate at the same temperature. They Neglect the temperature difference between the temperature of the fluid in the evaporator and the temperature of the reservoir, the thermal reservoir, or source or sink. Here you have a low temperature reservoir, and this is a negligible temperature difference, but you still have heat transfer into the fluid in the evaporator. So <coughs> you have Q from the low temperature source in. Likewise, in the condenser, they neglect the temperature difference between the fluid in the condenser and the hot, warmer thermal reservoir, the, the, the reservoir at temperature TH. And so you have Q, H out. So the work in from the compressor, out from the turbine, then you have the heat transfer in and out, QH and QL. Let's go ahead and solve a problem. So it says the uh, refrigerant 134A is the working fluid of a Carnot vapor refrigeration cycle. The evaporator temperature is negative 12. So this TL, negative 12 degrees C. Saturated vapor enters the condenser at 34 C. So TH is 34C. Saturated liquid exits the condenser at the same temperature. So saturated vapor, saturated liquid. The mass flow rate is M dot equal to 5 kilograms per 60 seconds. So 5 kilograms per minute. Determine the rate of heat transfer to the refrigerant passing through the evaporator. Now, they want it in kilowatts, and it's a rate of heat transfer, so we're asking to solve for Q dot in the evaporator, it's Q dot L, or Q dot E. That would be the product of the mass flow rate times, from an energy balance around the evaporator, the mass flow rate times enthalpy 1 minus enthalpy 4. True? Does that look good to you? So we need to get those enthalpies. How about the net power into the cycle? So that would be W dot net, which is W dot that is needed to drive the compressor minus what is the turbine produces, which is mass flow rate times H2 minus H1 for the compressor minus H2. Um, 3 minus H4 for the turbine. So we need the enthalpies to get the answer for part B. The mass flow rate's already given. And then the coefficient of performance, the COP, for the refrigeration 
and you can put Carno refrigeration. It makes a little long subscript, but it's, it's clear what we're getting. Uh, we're looking for the coefficient of performance is equal to what you desire, a large cooling, Q dot L, divided by what it, the net cost, W dot net. And what you'll find is that you can calculate the enthalpies, calculate the answer to part A and B, to perform the ratio and get the answer to part C. But then you also remember from Thermo 1 that isn't the Carnot efficiency equal to TL divided by TH minus TL as long as the temperatures are in absolute. And you can solve that using the other equation and you'll get exactly the same answer good to three digits and depending how you do it you may even get four. All right? Because there is property evaluations and the tables don't have infinite number of digits. So a good strategy is go ahead and make a table of uh, the state. Go ahead and put the pressure, maybe kilopascal or bar, some unit. Temperature, degrees C or Kelvin. Enthalpy in kilojoules per kilogram. And the entropy, kilojoules per kilogram in Kelvin. And because quality describes a lot of the states, you can you also put quality in there. And let's go ahead and put in, fill up this table for state 1, state 2, state 3, and state 4. So I recommend a, a clear illustration like this. A property diagram, TS, and a table for properties to help organize your work. So at uh, state one, it has a temperature of negative 12 degrees C, true. And it, we have an unknown quality, unknown entropy, and unknown enthalpy. That's a comma on that enthalpy. But it, it's like a comma with the units, comma with the units, comma with the units, comma with the units. Okay. So to get state one fixed, you can get the saturation pressure. So PSAT at negative 12, you look up in the table, it's 185.4 kilopascal or 1.854 bar. But to get the, you look back at state two, you know state two is saturated vapor. And so you can look up the temperature, well, it's given to you, it's 34 degrees C. You look up the corresponding pressure, 862.5 bar or kilopascal. And then you can look up this H, which is H of F, true, and S of F, and its quality is one, it's saturated vapor. Did I say F or G? I misspoke if I said subscript F. This is H of G, saturated vapor, and A S of G, true? Uh, it's the saturation pressure at 30, negative 12 as well as 34 degrees C okay. in the property tables because it's they're, they're two phase. Okay. So let's go ahead and uh, write those values down from state two. The entropy is 0 0.9058, and the enthalpy is 265.45. Now I can go back and work on state 1 because it's constant S. So the value of S1 is equal to the value of S2, so it's 0 0.9058. Now I can get the quality at state 1. The quality at state 1 based on S is equal to S minus S of F divided by SG minus S of F. How many people follow that logic? Good. And so I can look up or calculate the quality at state 1. And it's high. It's 0.9735. So it's 97% vapor. By mass or by volume? By mass, by mass, right? And it's uh, whatever it is left over is by by uh, by mass is in the liquid phase. So it's almost all vapor. And then we get the va the enthalpy at state one. How do we get enthalpy at one? Is that 
h of f plus quality at 1 h of f g. And so you get that this is 234.7. You come down now to state 3. Oh, that's saturated liquid, true. So that's 34, same pressure, 862.5. Quality is 0, saturated liquid. I look up, this is going to be H of F and S of F. So I draw those straight out of the tables. When I draw those out of the tables, I find that it's 0.3584 and 97.31. It's isentropic through that turbine from state 3 to 4. So it's 0.3584. The pressure drops down to the 185.4. It has negative 12 degrees C. It's two phase. I look up the quality. X4 is equal to, just like this equation right here, for X1, X4 is equal to S minus S of F divided by SG minus S of F, true. And so we get the quality at state 1 to be 0.2787, just a little under 30%. And then get the enthalpy at state 4, 91.74. Boom. So get the property values be able to calculate them all, and then go back and calculate then what is this uh, Q dot L, and it's around 11.9 kilowatts. That's the rate of cooling in the evaporator. W dot net, using this equation, is around 2.10 kilowatts, and this is you know, showing you that it takes less electric power to move a lot of heat. So that's, uh, you know, you took 2.1 kilowatts of electric power and you prov provided around 12 kilowatts of cooling at that temperature. And then the coefficient of performance for the refrigeration cycle is 5.68. Good to three digits either using the ratio here or going back to the temperatures. Good review? Does that help put it in context? All right. Now we're say how this is this is theory. This is the best you can do. All right. But in actual practice, you employ a vapor compression refrigeration system. So the vapor compression refrigeration system has an evaporator, just like what we talked about, has a condenser, just like what we talked about, has a compressor, but the compressor doesn't work feeding it two-phase. You really should feed it vapor. And so you want to feed it saturated vapor. So the state one is now what is saturated vapor. And so bring that over to the edge of your dome. That's one, state one, into the compressor. Now, the compressor, as shown, is reversible, adiabatic, so it's straight up on the TS diagram up to this line of constant pressure. This is your P high, high pressure line. So there's up to state two. State two now is superheated vapor. And it's higher than temperature TH. So it's really easy to reject heat as it cools the superheated vapor. And then now, depending on how you model it, is this fluid inside the condenser, does it have the same temperature as uh, the thermal reservoir in which you're dumping heat to? Let's model it as it is. Yes, it's the same temperature. But you know that the fluid inside the tubes of the condenser has to be hotter, or you're not going to push heat out of it. It's not going to condense. It's got So this has to be higher than this. But what we do is we just model it as the same temperature as the first approximation. You still take it over to saturated liquid. This is saturated liquid coming out. True at state 3. You could come out subcooled liquid, but just bring it out saturated liquid. Pass it through a restriction called an expansion valve. This is a flow through a finite pressure difference. It's highly irreversible. 
it's not like the turbine, we put a dashed line indicating that you're gaining entropy because of the irreversibilities, but you're still going to the low pressure, that's pressure low, dropping down to the low pressure in the evaporator. You have a quality, some X of four, two phase. So when you attack a problem like this, you want to get your illustration, your, your diagram, and get a table of properties, true? And then answer the questions as they're posed to you. Let's solve this problem. So refrigerant 134A is a working fluid in a vapor compression refrigeration cycle. The evaporator temperature is negative 12. So the temperature difference between the fluid in the evaporator and the, this uh, external, we're going to neglect it. It's just negative 12 degrees C. And the saturated vapor enters the turbine. Good. Saturated liquid exits the condenser. Sat lick over here, saturated liquid at state 3, and it comes out at 34. So um, this is uh, 34 degrees C. The temperature at state 2 is higher than 34 because it's superheated. You can see that on TS diagram. It's hot, very, very hot. The mass flow rate is the 5 kilograms per 60 seconds and ask the same questions. What is the rate of heat transfer? Q dot L, M dot times H, one minus H four, true. And then W dot net equal to M dot times H two minus H one. And notice there's no other subtracting a turbine. It's, it's just the net is what is required to drive the compressor, W dot C, true? And then the coefficient of performance for refrigeration is the prop ratio Q dot L over W dot net, or W dot C, because they're the same. There's only the power consumed to drive that compressor. If we had the power, if we had a fan, uh, for the evaporator and a fan for the condenser, we would could take that into consideration. But this is very simple calculations. Make a table. So the table would have your states. One, two, three, four. Pressure, maybe in kilopascal. Temperature in degrees C. Enthalpy in kilojoules per kilogram. Entropy in kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin and quality. I think that's helpful. So state one now is easier. We can fix that right away. It was negative 12 degrees C, corresponding pressure of 1.85 bar uh, or 185 kPa. The table has it in bar, does it not? And then the enthalpy. Now, I'm going to use the enthalpy values uh, from the software that you can use. We used it for uh, steam, and you can also evaluate those properties for uh, refrigerant, or you can look them up. But I'm going to give you values that are out of the, um, the Excel software. So 237.6 and 0.19. Oops, sorry about that. It's not that, it's this one. 243.29 and 0.93926 with a quality of one. When it goes to superheated, you have to find it in the table. And you're at what pressure are you gonna be at? You're gonna be at the saturation pressure corresponding to 34 degrees C. So you're not at 34 degrees C, State 3 is at 34, right? But state 2 is at higher than 34 degrees C, but the pressure corresponds to the saturation pressure at 34, so that's 862, 862, and then back down to 185. You have two high pressures, two low pressures. All right.
what you do is you find that S, 0.93926. So entropy and pressure fixed to state. If you want to put over here, how does it fix the state? Entropy and pressure, or P and S, pressure and entropy fix that state too. Hence, I can go and calculate H, and that's 275.26, and the temperature is um, up there. I didn't calculate it. Let it, let it go. All right. Now, let's take a look here. What about state three? Well, that's the pressure or the temperature in a saturated liquid, isn't it? And so we are down to at state three, 99.38 for enthalpy and 0.36676 for entropy. And it's saturated liquid quality is zero. What about four? How do I find four? What's what's constant? Is S constant? No. Enthalpy. Do an first law analysis around this expansion valve, and you find that enthalpy is what's known. So we're we're down to the low pressure and the enthalpy that fix that state. And it, we find that uh, we are two phase at state four. And so it's H minus HF divided by HFG to calculate the quality. The quality comes in at 0 0.306, a little over 30% or 30% quality. And then you can, if you want to, you can look up S, but it's not needed. But it's going to be larger. And then temperature is negative 12. It's two phase. We have all of those properties. And then you go ahead and calculate what is for the answer for part A. And you find it's around 12.0 kilowatts. And then for part B, net, it's around 2.66 kilowatts. W dot to drive the compressor. And then the coefficient of performance for the refrigeration. Now it's not Carnot. It comes in at 4.50 which, what was our coefficient of performance before? 5.68, so it's lower because of the irreversibilities. This, this temperature drop through the expansion always throws some students for a loop, right? It's like, hold it. How can I have flow and it's insulated? No heat transfer. How can I have something come in warm and go out cold. There's no shaft and there's no heat transfer. How can that possibly happen? And some of you have physical experience that says, oh yeah, I've, I've seen that. I felt it before. Somebody was telling me in the nine o'clock class, I sp used a spray can. When I sprayed a lot, it got colder. Anybody had that experience? Or anybody do refrigeration recharge? on their automobile air conditioning system. You can buy the can and put it in, and that cold can gets very cold, true? But if you haven't, I brought this along. And so this is for dust away, for cleaning your computers and keyboards and other electric equipment. And you can't really see it on the label here, but you can buy it at Alltech. It's real close by. But it has about 134A in it. That's the refrigerant. And you can slosh it, and I'll pass it around. And the sloshing indicates that there's liquid and vapor in the can. And you can feel, oh, it's so it's two-phase in here. And if you use it in the upright position, and you hold it like this and spray it, this is what you're supposed to do. And it cleans your keyboard of the dust, right? But the temperature coming out isn't cold. Because it's the vapors at the top, and the valve just lets the vapor out. But use it like you're not supposed to, and it demonstrates something very important. <laughs> so now the liquid's in the bottom. It's upside down, true. And when I pull this trigger, what comes out is liquid. It goes from a high pressure through a restriction to low. And I don't want to spray that on my hand. It will burn it. It'll be a freeze burn. So I put it in a napkin, which is clean, and I'm going to pass it around and let you feel it too. Pardon? 
do it on the chalkboard? Oh, but you'll see the foam. But I'm gonna, you can pass this around too. So you go like this, and now you can feel, and you say, will it be the same temperature as the room temperature? And so I pass it around and let you uh, sense it. And now I'm going to put John here. So hopefully this builds up your uh, intuition by experience. Those that have already done refrigerant recharge of automobile systems know exactly what I am. First time you felt that can, it's like cold because it's discharging, right? And it's coming out cold. And so the whole thing gets very cool. Or also other people said spray cans do the same thing. Well, what I'd like to do also is um, uh, just do a general overview of the air conditioning system. Uh, I always tell people when they pass Thermo 2, you can expect that you're going to go home on vacation or whatever, spring break or summer. They're going to say, oh, what, what did you learn? What do you study? Mechanical engineering. What classes do you take? Thermodynamics. Tell me a little bit about it. Oh, I learn about power, engines, and gas turbines and refrigeration systems. And somewhere they're going to grab you and say, I've got a problem with my car, or I always wanted to know how the jet engine worked, or I have a problem with my home or my automobile air conditioning system. Come quick and diagnose it for me. It'll happen. Guarantee it. And so here is the air conditioning system in the home. This is a, a manufacturing company located in Houston, Goodman. Uh, they do really good. They're reputable. Uh, it's, they have a large share of the HVAC market out there, and it's located in Houston. Here's the air, outside unit or the condenser, or the condensing unit. Inside, or you have the condensing coils. You have a fan to draw the air from the outside across the condensing coils and then eject upward, typically. And that is rejecting heat to the air outside. You also have the compressor sitting down here making a lot of racket as well as the fan making a lot of racket. So it's noisy and you put it on the back side, hopefully not near your bedroom window. Because it, it hurt it when it kicks on. True? Okay. Uh, now you have two lines. One will be refrigerant coming to it. One will be refrigerant going out back. One line typically is larger diameter. One line is smaller diameter. One line is for vapor flow, one line is for liquid flow. And then I ask questions like, which one needs a larger diameter, the vapor or the liquid? And that always throws students for a loop, too. But uh, one is insulated, one is bare. One, if you take the insulation off and touch it, it'll either sense hot or cold. The bare, you touch it, it'll sense hot or cold. Which one and why? You'll be asked all these questions uh, by your cousins, your grandmothers, your whatever. <laughs> your, your, everybody will ask them. Then it goes up, the lines go up to the furnace or to the place where you have another fan to blow air across, basically an evaporator coil. And the evaporator coil, then for air conditioning, it drops the temperature. Now it's cold air. And you draw that out and throw that into different rooms through some sort of, thank you, supply. In this room right here, there's a supply, there's a supply, there's a supply. I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Did I miss one? Oh, one, two, there's four and four, okay? Now the return are there, 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 and there, there, there. And I think, crazy enough, this is a return right up here. I think they grab the chalk and suck it into this grill right here. I've seen it in some rooms. Maybe this one isn't. There's some fabric right here. And then it goes in a wall up and goes into uh, basically a, a plenum return system. Inside the house, uh, keep your doorways open or a large gap under them because usually the hallways are the return air. And then you go over to a wall, and there'll be a grill in the wall, and it'll have a filter. And then it goes in, up, and through the furnace. Okay, So you always have a filter somewhere. Or you'll have the filter in the ceiling. And then you just unscrew, bring it down, take the filter, replace it every month or so. So it goes through a filter and then out. So you have basically the evaporator up here, the condenser, condensing coil there. 
I always encourage you to do this. I do it in Thermo 1. I'm giving you a review. Is cover stuff up when you learn and then start seeing if you can remember. Like, oh, what's this little thing hanging on the wall that allows the homeowner to adjust the temperature thermostat? Right? Some of them are programmable. Uh, what did they call this? What did they call, you know, this? Uh, what did they call this? Uh, what did they call this? What did they call that? Here's another blow up. So they have a cutaway also of the coil. So that's the condenser coil. Usually it wraps around at least two and a half, three, three and a half sides of your unit. And then here's a compressor. That one looks like a hermetically sealed compressor sitting on little rubber grommets because of the vibration. And you have some other, looks like a, a coil, I mean a, a capacitor and some contacts. The fan draws the air over the coils and expels it out. And so you reject heat in the condensing unit. Here's the lines where the coolant or refrigerant flows in and out. Comes up to what we call A coil, pretty standard. Airflow is open here underneath, and so it flows up and kind of does a zag across the coil. Why do they not put it flat? Well, because when you're in the summer, you wring moisture out of the air, and that moisture has to collect and go somewhere. So by gravity, it will drain down, and there'll be a little catch pan down on both of these sides. And then it catches and goes over to a little drain line, and then that'll drain, typically go to the outside of the house and drip. And somebody's walking around and say, hey, you got a problem in your house because it, it's dripping right here. Where's this water coming from? Drain line off your air conditioning system. Um, the, uh, also, what happens to this if it plugs up? Uh, nasty stuff. So make sure you keep that drain line. They usually pour a little Clorox. If you're at home, do it yourself, or you can do it with Clorox and compress there. Or invite the, the guys out, because HVAC industry, they get lots of calls when it goes over 100, and they get lots of calls when it goes freezing. You know, It's like heating and cooling. And they're bored to death in the spring and fall when it's beautiful weather, right? Your windows are open, the doors are open. That's when they really should be doing service calls and just going around and checking to make sure and then they'll actually pour some Clorox in or some other cleaner and blow compressed air through. And that way, when it happens and it's 100 degrees and they have 20 calls per hour coming in, um, you, won't have, you won't be that emergency call. Okay, same with the air filter right here. If you don't replace that air filter, what's the consequence? I save $3 per month. Or if it's $8 per filter per month, I'm way ahead. All that lint will collect on this A-coil. And first of all, you can start to smell it because all you need is some lint and some other moisture, and boom, you've got growth. You've got growth. And now all those spores that are growing there get carried and distributed all over your house. Oh, great. So you get to breathe mold. Not good, right? But it will collect there. And when it starts to collect so much, it mats up and it blocks the airflow. And you'll feel it in the house. It's like, how come I, I used to get some really good airflow in this room. Now it's, you, prob, you may have blockage on your A coil. And so what happens is, is they got to come in, they got to pull that unit out, cut the lines, take it out in your backyard and flush it with some good chemicals to get it clean again, and then bring it back in. The other thing what will happen is if it mats up, It'll get so cold in some sections, it ices up. And when it starts to ice up, you get ice buildup on your coils. So there's a lot of bad consequences to not having good filters that you repeatedly change out when they start to get full. Because you really want to protect your A-coils. And then there's the blower, the fan, that, that uh, provides the movement for the air. How about a car? You pop the hood. And you see, where's all the air conditioning components in the hood, under the hood? You might want to look for this guy first. Where's the compressor? It's typically driven by a belt off of the serpentine belt somewhere. And you can typically find it, right? Uh, that's a good starting point. Then you look for 
connections coming to it and going away from it. The one that goes away from it will go to the condensing coil that's typically located before or in front of the radiator. And so the airflow across the radiator will be the same airflow as across the, the condensing coil. Notice they change color in this illustration. Red hot, high pressure. It comes out not so hot but still warm. Then it goes through a filter dryer because it goes into an expansion valve which restricts or controls the flow of refrigerant into this coil which is the evaporator which is inside the car somewhere up under the glove box somewhere where your feet are typically over in the passenger side and you'll have a blower motor fan that'll circulate that air take it put it over across that coil and then blow it out the dash or, or up at the window the defrost or uh, wherever you have it blowing out in your automobile. How many people have run their AC so far this year even in 2014? Yeah, I did even the other day just driving home. It's like, hey, turn that air up. <laughs> I'm hot in the back seat. It's February. You should be fine. Turn the air up. I want some cool. All right. So this is a very interesting device. They have a number of them. Here, I'm going to pass this one around. I show students in Thermo 1, but you have... Two ins and two outs, okay? So this passage through this way, it basically senses the temperature of the refrigerant leaving the evaporator, and it's it, 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 there's a bulb right in the middle, okay? That's not to block the flow, but to sense the temperature of the flow going through it. Now, that is nice and big, and it's gas in there, and it helps expand when it's warm and contract when it's cold and it's connected to a diaphragm which accentuates the expansion and the contraction and then it controls a little needle coming down here and when it expands because it's warm it lifts the needle lets more refrigerant go and when it's too cold it collapses pushes the needle down seats it and shuts off the flow so it control it's a control mechanism so i'm going to pass that around for you I'm also going to pass this one around. This is a student that was taking the class with me. Can you just pass those around, please? So that uh, is a control in, in this system. So the filter dryer is to prevent a little debris from coming up there and plugging it. And guess what? If you ever had an air conditioning system installed in a car, and then all of a sudden it freezes up, the person says, oh, I just have to turn it off and let it defrost for a minute. And then I'll turn it back on and it'll work again. Anybody been in a car like that? Cars have gotten so much better. But uh, what happens is, is it, it freezes right there. It'll build up because you have moisture in there. And so the drier part is to get the moisture out because you don't want it to go and then ice right in your critical passageway and block it. Okay? So that's where you'll ice up uh, in this passage right here. And then it goes back out. Now, this, I like the way they change the color. They change the color so you can see, oh, it's low pressure gas, low pressure liquid, high pressure liquid, high pressure gas. And if anybody ever does any work, typically they put some gauges on. They put two taps, one for high pressure side measurement, and one for the low pressure side measurement. They can diagnose the system. You have typically not enough refrigerant. But sometimes it could be overcharged. You have too much refrigerant in the system. So, so there you go. There is the, an illustration taken off the Internet, which color codes and directions for arrows. I encourage you to go ahead and take a look at home, walk around, see things, as well as pop the hood in a car. Maybe it's a little easier for a car. Do you pop the hood and do anything with the car running, unless you're a pro. Because clothing... Hair, rotating machinery, woo, very, very dangerous. True? Be very cautious, rotating machinery. Well, with that, I just want to summarize today. We talked about the major components of the refrigeration system. Compressor, condenser, expansion valve, evaporator. True? All this, I hope, was pretty good review of Thermo 1. We talked about sketching on a temperature entropy diagram talked about the coefficient of performance for refrigeration. 
for a Carnot cycle, you can get it in terms of temperatures. But in general, for the vapor compression refrigeration, it's how much cooling per how much work was provided. The work balance you can replace by, just like work net can be replaced by QNet, you can do that too. But I didn't do that for any problem. Okay. Any questions? Well, those things are still being passed around. If you want to play with something cold, you can do that. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>